Good morning, South Beach. What's up, everybody? It's Patrick Healy, host of the Brooklyn Boxing Podcast, and we are in the famous Fifth Street Gym. I'm joined by the owners here, Dino and Tom. Can't wait to talk about their podcast that's soon to launch. So excited to be here, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Very excited to have you. Our pleasure. And, uh, you know, I was looking at your story right away, both Chicago guys. Dino, you were telling me a few stories earlier about, you know, some tough Scrabble moments in Chicago with your mom. <laughs> but I'm curious about, you know, learning a little bit about your guys' relationship. You know, you're, you're good friends, obviously, known each other for, I believe, 30 years or something like that, right? Yeah, he's been trying to get rid of me, and he's saying it doesn't work. <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it? No, I'm trying. But tell me about the, I guess, the journey of Fifth Street Gym. And I, and I will mention also, happy belated birthday a few, few weeks ago, right? And, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali's birthday as well. Obviously, he's such a huge um, aura and presence of this gym. But tell me a little bit about the journey of this gym from, you know, the Ali days, then to reopening in 2009 and moving to this location and, you know, really becoming a gym where you have fighters, you have everyday people. Um, tell me about that path, that journey. Tom or Dino, you can both jump into it. Angelo Dundee's brother uh, started the gym before even Angelo. And, that, and actually, that's then he hired Angelo, brought Angelo in to, to work as just a trainer. So that's how it started. Um, in Miami Beach, when Miami Beach was like old people retirement in the 50s, I think it started in 1950. 50. Yeah, so it's a it's a far cry from what South Beach or Miami Beach is now. Uh, it was an old, like I said, a retirement community. The, you know, really, literally old people, and uh, everything was cheap, was very affordable. And Angelo actually came and lived in the gym and worked for his older brother that was so much older than they barely knew each other. He left the house long before Angelo. Angelo went from Philadelphia, worked in New York to learn the craft of being a coach, and then came and worked for his brother and lived in the gym, was paid very meagerly, I, from what I hear, um, but just enough to get by. That being said, uh, the location, Angelo, his brother, they called him the wizard, like the Wizard of Oz, because he really had, he had the whole boxing business. I saw you called the gym the Oz, right, at times yeah, like exactly. that, yeah. So, uh, Tom, you could speak more to, like, Angelo and... Yeah, so the way we got into it is we, we came down here originally, uh, we had a friend of ours that had another boxing gym, so we never wanted to, to get into it. Uh, he wanted up leaving, so he left the door open, so we were basically walking down the street one day, we saw a sign with the original Fifth Street Gym was, I'm like, why don't we just reopen up the Fifth Street Gym? He's like, come on, you know, we're not going to be able to afford it, and, you know, how are we going to do it? And we did it. We went and got the name, got the website, we talked to the landlord, he said, you know, we're looking for some big to come in here, but we'd love to have you guys in here. And gave us a lease, you know, like a temporary lease. So uh, eventually CBS went in there and we started working and work got out. And then um, Angelo kind of came to us through the guy he used to know and he wanted to be part of it. And you know, the rest is history, as they say, you know. Right. You know, but September, I think 26th is the day, 2010. Uh, there's a whole story within that on how, how we got open and how we got Muhammad here. And we had to get like kind of a private jet and flying down here. <laughs> That's yeah, great. The stories keep evolving from the gym. Right. And you know, when we were in the process of opening, we heard there's a book, Tales from the Fifth Street Gym, a famous book. Um, and there's always been this, it's always been action and, and it's always been that way. And that was, and it was, it seemed to be because of Andrew Dundee, Muhammad Ali, and the other 14 world champions that came from the gym. But then we opened. And it just, day one, it started all over again. And obviously it's not because of me or Tom, it's the Fifth Street Gym, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So um, the fact that on opening night, there was 300 members of the press. It was so packed that the ex-mayor of Miami Beach couldn't get in. The fireman told me, one more person gets in, I'm shutting you down. The guy still don't talk to me to this day. So um, the amount of celebrities that came to the grand opening, and again, not to see me, but to see Mohammed. Um, it's just, it's unbelievable. And then after they, they have 300 people in a 2,000 square foot space, it's impossible. 
insane. It's must insane. have been it must have been super hot. I know it's hot alleys. in here today. <laughs> people in the alley, yeah. people in the front, people in the side, people clamoring to get in, people mad at me for not letting them in. Try to break in their neck to take a picture with Muhammad. There were almost 15 world champions in the gym at that, you know, former world champions in the gym that night. It was a madhouse. Uh, the next day, the place was, you know, it was all brand new before we started. By the end of the day, there was bottles everywhere. It was just a mess, right? And then the story start already. We're sitting there on that old tire, and I asked everyone to come and help me clean up, and only two guys, Nico Valdez and Lazar Stojadinovic, my mom, my sister, and Tom, came back the next day to clean up, and out of the blue, who shows up? Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and he sits down on that tire, and there's about 15 black and white pictures that we have, that we have had hanging, we just painted, so we took them down, but they're going back up. From the gym, and about seven or eight of them are of him, and he sat there in a really low voice, and told us he remembered every single story from what happened that day. And I get goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and from then, at that point on, people all of all walks of life and a lot of very famous people out of the blue just pop in. I mean, you guys were here a couple days ago. Tifa Lopez. Exactly. Oh, exactly. World Champion. I didn't invite him. Well, that's what, exactly what I was going to jump in and talk about is the other night, you know, you were having the uh, sparring, sparring event here, Bad Boy Gloves. Uh, shout out to those guys. They put on a great event and, uh, you know, you're in the ring calling the fights and we definitely enjoyed it. And then all of a sudden, Tiafimo and Edgar Berlanga walk in. I'm like, what the hell? These guys just showed up out of, out of nowhere. Tiafimo, obviously, you know, the undisputed champ and Edgar is a young stud coming from Brooklyn. Both guys, I got to shout out that 16 and 0, 16 first knockouts. round knockouts. Um, but yeah, just to your point, you know, you never know who's going to stop by. You had Ludacris in here a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, a couple days ago. And, uh, you know, the stars are just in and out all the time. But that's just the energy of this gym, right? And then when you guys brought it back, I'm sure, you know, just to see how Muhammad Ali reacted to that, I'm sure he was so excited to have this staple place of Miami Beach. I mean, it means so much to the community, the community of this gym, right? I mean, it's, it's a you know staple. what was most exciting is to see how excited Angelo was. Angelo, yeah. You know, he took me to the Boxing uh, Hall of Fame. They, they inducted the ring from Madison Square Garden. I'm going to get goosebumps again. They inducted, they inducted the ring of Madison Square Garden to the Boxing Hall of Fame. So he told a bunch of stories about, uh, you know, about the fights that were in that ring. And uh, it was a, a black out ballroom. He was up on, at a dais um, and speaking on a microphone, and the spotlight was on him. After we was finished telling the stories, uh, there was everybody who's anybody in boxing. There were so many legends, Carmen Basilio and and right, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard, was, you name it, they were all there. Right? The list goes on and on, right? And uh, he goes, hey, you see that kid over there? And everybody who's anybody in boxing turns, they put the spotlight on me. He's like, he's bringing the Fifth Street gym back. I was like, <gasps> I mean, I, it was breathtaking. It was unbelievable. And Angel was so excited about it. And then after that, after that, we, you know, we opened and we were, it was, you know, people were, Miami Beach wasn't what it was. The rent was super high. It was very stressful. It wasn't, you know, retirement community where you just rent an apartment across the street for a hundred bucks. To get fighters to come here was very challenging to try to find them sponsors so they could live here. And it was, we were struggling to get things going. And Angelo was sitting at the desk and he's like, um, he's like, listen kid, this is your, this is your baby. This is your responsibility. I did it. You got to keep it going. Otherwise people won't know what the Fifth Street Gym is. Wow, Angelo Dundee handing over the yeah. keys to you. I mean, that's an amazing, overwhelming, must have been an amazing feeling. Overwhelming. So the the business has gone down, and we've been struggling. And thank God, my family and friends have helped finance it to keep it going. Um, it, it's you know it's like challenging sometimes, but thank God we've kept it going. Um, we have a new partner. His name is Anthony Fontana, and he's brought a martial art concept to the to the gym. Yeah. And you know MMA is so huge, and it's you know every. You know, there's only so many ways to bend your arms and legs, <laughs> so we want to cover it all. We saw you working earlier just before this podcast. You're rolling around yeah, practicing the jiu-jitsu. Exactly. And, I'm trying to always learn something else. But before, um, I, you know, I, I just want to jump into, um, you know, of course, the talk a lot about the fighters that are currently training here. But before I do that, you know, I think we just got to dive a little deeper into Muhammad Ali. And obviously, you guys having personal relationships with him. He's obviously so closely tied to this gym. Um, you know, just tell me a little bit about what it was like to have a relationship with the greatest. I mean, it's like he's an icon. I can't imagine, um, you know, spending time with him and, and you guys were close with him. So if you both, you know, just have any sort of stories, you know, I'd love to. I'm sure the fans watching want to like know. Tom was like his best friend for the next three years. 
And there was his sister-in-law who took care of, she's just a saint, who took care of everything he possibly needed. And then there was Tom, they were like, you know, thick thieves. So, I mean, he's got the best stories in the world. It, it really was by accident. Uh, you know, he had a place in uh, Bear Lake Springs, Michigan, and that's at the farm. That's where he used to do all his training, that's where he used to spend a lot of his summers. And uh, she just happened to be coming up when, in, uh, in the summer. She's like, yeah, I'm coming up to Chicago. What are you doing? So, yeah, come stay with me, you know, you know, stay in college. So she came up there, spent a few days up there, and I thought that was it. I won't see her for a while. She calls me up. She's like, Muhammad and I are coming up to Chicago. What are you doing? I said, yeah, come by. I had restaurants at the time. So uh, my cousin came to visit me, and they pull up in front, and Muhammad gets out of the car and says, I think, uh, I think Lonnie, uh, his wife, and Marilyn are coming to the restaurant. And my cousin's walking by and just did one of these and he went, <laughs> you know, I'm not walking into a, like a breakfast restaurant. And it's like, like he just, people would just panic around him. Grown men would cry, women would cry. And it was just something, and get goosebumps too. But at the open, grown men, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, just would just see him and just cry everywhere you went, everywhere we go. And sometimes they would do a double take because they're like, nah, that can't be him. You know, like we would just be driving around and pull over and people would be like, like, no, that's not what would he be doing, you know, with me? And uh, he was just so fun to be around. He was, he was, like they say, like everyone said, man, he was, he was just a great guy. And I mean, he went out to Arizona with one of our, our friends here and they went to have lunch with him, you know, just out of nowhere. I said, Marilyn, just, you know, he was coming to town, you know, they went, he'd go to lunch and he loved being around people and he loved, he just had a personality that's... It's bigger than awesome. life, yeah. He loved being around people and he loved to just hang out and chit chat and you could ask him as many questions. You could ask him, I could ask him, you could ask him about the Rumble and Jumble 50 times, he'll answer, he'll tell you. He doesn't care. He doesn't, there's no, there's never too much for him. It's unbelievable. At the grand opening, he stayed in San Andreas. He was really not well at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really near the end. And he stayed, they gave him medicine to stop him from shaking. So it would make him super tired, the medicine. And it would make him super tight and make his throat tight. And he stayed until we dragged him out of there. We had to make him go home. And he came back the next day as soon as he could. It was unbelievable. That day we went, we had lunch. First of all, the guy eats like a horse. <laughs> Heavyweight. <laughs> I mean, he was, you know, you think of him, he's, you know, you think of an old man who's not well, you're worried about their appetite. They don't, don't worry about his appetite because he ate like a champ. <laughs> Number two, he, uh, I was, we were sitting there and I, and I got a, I saw a tweet that said Lennox Lewis wanted to come out of retirement to fight Vladimir Klitschko for a hundred million dollars. And I, I said, hey, Muhammad, guess what? Like, I'm giving him boxing news and he didn't skip a beat. He's like, oh, I was like, both of them. <laughs> that is classic. I mean, he's, it was just unbelievable. He was exactly like you see on TV all the time. Even at his oldest and his sickest, it didn't matter. He was still the champ. And that energy really lives on, like, through the gym today. I'm sure all the fighters in here, I mean, that has to be in the back of your mind. You know, I'm training in the place, Fifth Street Gym. I mean, the history of this gym. I got to live up to that and fill I mean, those there'd, shoes. There'd be times where I'd be sitting here and I'd call up and we'd FaceTime and he would watch the spar with me and everyone would be like... Muhammad Ali's watching me spar, and he'd be like, I want to see somebody fall. So, you know, I mean, one time I got Oliver McCall, who's a former heavyweight champ of the world, to lay down and fight like he got hit and went and I got knocked out, <laughs> you know. Like, heavyweight champ, Oliver McCall. Right. I'm like, Muhammad wants you to go down, whatever. It's like, sure, he kind of got hit, and he laid down like he got knocked out. Guy's never been knocked down in his entire career, <laughs> world champion. Right. But he would do it, like, it's, it's great, like you said. He just had this awesome personality, this aura about him, and... It, I think it continues. There's got to be something with the gym that it's the energy. You know, it's not. Yeah. I mean, he does an awesome job. Don't get me wrong. With the fighters, he's here and in, 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 in the privates, and he's up at six o'clock in the morning, and he's here at nine o'clock at night. But last week we did a Christmas party. Now, so last month we did a Christmas party. Now it's kind of making albums because I used to have a restaurant, so I'm making yeah. the albums. And I looked up for a second. I see a crowd. And one of our fighters, he's six foot nine. I'm like. Who's that guy that's tall sitting next to him? I'm like, that looks like Tyson Fury. I'm like, what the hell Tyson Fury would do here? I'm like, that's Tyson Fury. Just watch a Christmas party. We, we, if I would have invited him, he wouldn't have counted. But out of the blue, he comes, he's like, I've been walking around all day looking for this place. He's wearing pink Versace. His kids are wearing Fendi shorts and no shirts Rolexes. and $40,000 gold Rolexes on. <laughs> His wife and him were so pleasant and so, they were so honored to be here. I was honored to have them and they one up me. They were like, no, no, no. We're so flattered, so glad. I was like, champ. 
He took, and he was, in, in, and it, it humbles people to come here. Mm -hmm. Muhammad humbles everybody, the, 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 just the, the spirit of Muhammad Ali, to the point where he did a Muhammad Ali and took as many pictures and asked as many. He wasn't too busy. He's on vacation. Right. He's got better things to do than sit around with a bunch of us, you know. With, there's no reason to sit here. He sat here and took as many pictures and asked as many questions. It like brings up, this place brings up the best of people. And I hold it over, I hold Muhammad Ali over his head. Right. <laughs> Muhammad Ali ran six miles to the gym every day. Don't, if you don't, if you're a it's, fighter. It sweats and, and work and, boots, Exactly. Right? So yeah. if, you're, if you're crying about, if you're crying about running, I, I, I bust your chops about that. If you're, if you're a celebrity, you act a little too celebrity out of me, I bust your chops about that. They say, oh, you know, so I've had celebrities ask me, and I don't want to say who, but. Uh, can you shut the gym for me? I said, we didn't shut it for Muhammad Ali. We're not shut it for you. And they shut <laughs> right, up. Right. Boom. Right. Problem solved. So obviously the other day, you know, Tiafimo Lopez stopped by and he shocked the world against Lomachenko, right? I mean, everyone was expecting Lomachenko to win that fight. Not a lot of people had Tiafimo, but he pulled it off. What are your thoughts on him in the division in terms of his potential matchups against Devin Haney, against Gervonta Davis, Ryan Garcia? That lightweight division's on fire, so I'd be curious to get you know, your guys' he, thoughts on I know that. he says Brooklyn, but he spent a lot of time living in Miami. He trained here a lot. I didn't train him. His dad trained him. And he sparred with, we, we would spar with adults. He would work with the kids his age and not try to blow them up. He's a very nice kid. Uh, that being said, when he was here, I told him, I said, hey, and he forgot. I had to remind him when he was here. Save me a seat in the front row when you fight for the title. And, uh, and when you're gonna be the world champion. And everyone thought, taught, you know, like I was like, kind of like just pumping him up. But he had something special, he clearly proved it. Um, I actually won money on the fight. I put my money where my mouth is. I bet I didn't need to have my seat because I got cash. <laughs> so um, I, I really believe in the kid. That, also we have Devin Haney comes down here and does his camp here. What a great kid, so respectful, so polite. But these guys are dogs. They're please and thank you. And they're hugs and kisses and so respectful to me and to everyone at the gym. But when they get in there and start mixing up, man, they're serious business. So uh, anything could go. I mean, everyone feels like Tank is the toughest guy, maybe the biggest power. I feel like Tank is going to have trouble continuing to make weight. Um, I think that's a challenge. I think a lot of money has been won and lost on the scales in boxing. And that's a big challenge for him. Um, Tia Fimo's confidence. I mean, you know, punch, they, they all punch hard. They all punch fast. They all have defense. They all have, I mean, at that level, they're all super good and way better than anyone at home thinks they are. Right. You're sitting on your couch and you think you would have blocked and you would have did this and you would have did that. Let me tell you, these 135 pound men could beat up six foot 200 pounders and put, put them to sleep. So um, these guys are really special animals. Right. That being said, it's about them being 100% on, night, on game night and Tia Fimo knows how to do that. Definitely. A lot of people don't realize and I, I, I give the, the, the example of tennis. You know, I've watched tennis number thousand guy versus the number one and two guy, their talent level as far as playing is right there. It's a little different in boxing, but it's the confidence. If you don't have the confidence in yourself, I don't care what you do. You know, that's what made Michael Jordan the greatest of all time. Confidence. He had the talent. You have to have the talent. There's Michael Jordan, there's the big buckuses of the world. One works hard, one has talent, but it's the confidence. Anything you do, like you said, it's been confident. And that confidence in the heavyweight division right now, I mean, we see a guy like Tyson Fury, obviously, you talked about how him, how he stopped by the gym for the Christmas party, but, I mean, his confidence is all-time high. He walked down Wilder, finished him in devastating fashion in the early, was it, fourth round, fourth, fifth round? So, in the heavyweight division right now, do you see anyone challenging Tyson Tyson Fury in this? Probably AJ is next. Yeah, it seems no, I'd like. love to. I would love to see Tyson and AJ fight, but the boxing business is making it wait, making everyone wait way too long for it. Yeah, I mean, I guess they. Fight. I mean, if you want, if you know, if you're AJ, you want to wait till he's a little too old to fight, right? You're trying to hold off as long as you can. You're trying to increase your own experience. He's like I said, he's got an extremely high fight IQ. The other guy's an extreme talent athletically. Every fight, he's going to get more educated in boxing. So the more they can get him and the more they can hold off, the more bored. It's hard for fighters to stay motivated day in and day out. Because they, they only, like I said, they can only bend their arms in like so many times, so many ways. We try to, we throw medicine balls around and we use rubber bands and sledgehammers and this. But in the end, they throw a jab, cross, hook, uppercut, and you go for a run. And you spar. We had a, a Christian Toon sparring with uh, Andre Arlovsky. Right. And, you know... Andre practices boxing probably 30% of the time. So when Christian practices 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same thing. It's hard, it's, it's hard to stay motivated 
when you're even sparring. You know, now he's gonna go spar AJ next week. So he's gonna be, now he's sparring the heavyweight champion of the world, he's excited. But how excited is AJ to spar Christian? He's six and all. You see what I'm saying? So right. how does he stay motivated? How does Tyson Fury stay motivated when they stall and delay him months after months? Pretty maybe that camp is when he's finally burned out. Right, yeah. And then all, everyone goes, oh, see, I knew that AJ could beat him. Yeah, but could he beat him 18 months ago? That's the difference with guys like Ali and Frazier, Marciano. They managed to just not, you know, they didn't drink. I mean, as far as I know, he didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He didn't go out. He didn't run around. So to stay motivated, you really got to want to be champion. You know what I mean? You can't, these guys get bored. You left them, you know. I mean, look at Joshua. You know, he got knocked out by Andrew Ruiz. Right. Great talent, great amateur. He clearly great. wasn't motivated for that fight. Right. He's talented. You saw what he did when he was one. Then he won easy. Exactly, and and that's kind of my next question too. Is the other the other kind of extreme rather than being unmotivated? Is like when does your confidence lean into cockiness, or when when can that get you in trouble? Or you can't can back you back it up? Can you be over? Yeah, I mean, if you know, if you, if you you know, I mean, look, I almost wonder if that ever exists because look at when Lomachenko clearly is more technical. Than Tiafimo. Mm -hmm. He's got more experience than Tiafimo. Couldn't beat him. You know, he made adjustments. He thought he was going to adjust, 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 and then the fight was gone. He lost it. You know, when, when, when Ali won the world title, he shocked the world because, man, that big bear, everyone was scared of him. You know, so everyone was scared of him except for Ali. Right, yeah. So it doesn't So the self belief and everything yeah, just carried through. I mean, it, you know, every, and that's all that matters. And you only got to be, you only got to do it one time, really. Mm -hmm. You know, Tia Fimo could lose to Lomachenko 15 times after this. It won't matter. He already took that belt from him. He already, he's 100 years old. He goes to bed. He's still the world champ. Undisputed. That's it. For the rest of his life, he's the world champ, no matter what happens after that. So um, I don't know if there's ever such a thing, except for if you don't train. Because if you can't read, you can't fight. So if you can believe in this and that and the other, you run out of gas. Well, then... You, know, you could have a Ferrari with no gas in it, really. You're not going to <laughs> right. In today's boxing game, too, um, just to kind of wrap up here, but he, the game is on fire, right? I mean, in recent years, I would say the heavyweight division, we got stars, lightweight division. Canelo, obviously, is bouncing around. the. He's another huge star bouncing around the middleweights, the middleweight and light heavyweight classes. But it's a great time for boxing. I think a lot of people are tuning in, a lot of new fans. Obviously, there's some some YouTubers and things getting involved. Yeah, great. great. Maybe it brings more eyeballs. I'd be curious to hear maybe a little of your thoughts on that. Um, but it's a good time for boxing right now, Absolutely. I believe, right? Yeah. Well, we trained with, actually, we had Jake Paul come and train. Guy's in super good shape and super serious. He's limited on experience. He's getting more experience all the time. We had Danny work with him a little bit in Spire. They did, did a great job. He takes it very seriously. Um, and I think more eyeballs, the better. But I'll tell you, boxing is on TV constantly. And they don't put it on for no reason. And they put crappy European fights on, on networks as I'm down the dial. My, my DVR records anything that says the word boxing. <laughs> if someone bought a box in a kid story, it gets recorded. So um, that being said, they don't, they're not putting out unless they're making money from it, which means people must be watching it. Content is so, you know, at a premium now. There's right. so many channels. There's so, there's, there's so many web channels and so on and so forth, but they're putting out for a reason. So people must be watching. And, exactly. you know, you mentioned Tyson Fury, um, but one of your fighters, Christian Thun, young heavyweight, 6 and 0 prospect, and the Hurricane, yeah. And, and when I first saw him, I said, man, he's one big dude. And you're telling me that he's bigger than Tyson Fury. He's clearly bigger than Tyson Fury. Yeah, he's now, good. now, Tyson's Tall, got Tyson's taller, yeah. And heavier. Yeah. Uh, Tyson's got the uh, boxing IQ. I mean, a genius. Like, right, right. And, and my guy's got a lot to learn. But boy, is he big. <laughs> right, yeah, he's a big, big guy. And I want to, you know, highlight some of the guys in the gym. And, you know, we were talking with Christian earlier, a very nice guy and young prospect on his way up. Like I said, he's enormous. Look out for him, the Hurricane. But then you also have, you know, some some guys fighting for belts soon. Danielle, uh, Daniele Scardina fighting for the European um, yeah, he's already the IBF international champion, and now we're going to go for the EBU title. Um, I think he's got the world title lined up in our in our sights. And I've never I've trained a lot of guys from a lot of different martial arts and fighting sports. I've trained UFC fighters and so on and so forth. And the UFC fighters kind of get guys that have the wrestling backgrounds get the you know like they're the hardest workers. There's nobody that works harder than them. And he's Italian, of course. And he's Italian. The shirt. That's it. Uh, you know, my, my grandparents are Italian. He's from Italy. And, uh, you know, he came here on a vacation, again, like a fluke. 
He fought his last fight. It was in the World Series of Boxing. He came on vacation. He said, hey, can you hold pads for me? I said, actually, I only hold pads for $200 private lessons or professional fighters. And he was like, oh, the next day he came back. He's like, I want to be a professional fighter. I'm like, what do you mean you want to be a professional fighter? He's like, I just fought in the World Series of Boxing. I'm the Italian team. I won. Here's my record. He had a, a good, a small, but a good amateur record. I said, well, if you can get a visa to come here, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. We wound up getting him a sponsor to get to pay, actually pay for his visa, worked it out. The next thing you know, we get him his first fight that was actually in a prison in the Dominican Republic. Wow. Yeah. yeah. In, a, in a prison that was built during the days of Christopher Columbus. Wow. It was unbelievable. That's like the old uh, James Scott, right, fighting in Rahway yeah. State Prison in, in Jersey. That exactly. was an old HBO show. We and went there to fight a prisoner. That was our first It's insane. Yeah, so that's, never, that's, that's still going on. Yeah, it's still going on. <laughs> so, um, and he, that kid has never missed, and I, I'm not exaggerating, he's never missed a session. Wow. He's never caught, he comes in with a, like a hand, like, all, like my, he's like, uh, you know, can I only use my left today? Because I'm looking at my right. He comes limping in. You know, we did, yesterday we did the track. He did 800, 800 meter laps in under three minutes with a one minute break. Under three minutes, one minute break. 12 of them, back to back to back. The kid's an animal. If you're gonna beat him, you better kill him because he's not going away soon. Yeah, everyone go check him out. Daniele Scardina. February 26th on the zone. On the zone. Check that out. Super nice guy. I know Angela Dundee said it doesn't cost anything to be nice, right? And a lot of the fighters that I've met in here seem like super nice guys. Another one. Uh, the baboon I met earlier, the bare knuckle, 155 champ, super nice guy, and he's another one of your guys that's, you know, he's taken over a new avenue now, formerly MMA, now bare knuckle, and he's on top of the game, 155, and, and that seems like a very growing market as well, the bare knuckle Man, scene, it's crazy. Bare knuckle, I can't get over it, there's no bad judges. There's nothing to complain about because someone either got cut or got knocked out. So no one's <laughs> crying about, I got robbed. He's the hometown guy. He's the A side, the B side. It doesn't matter, right? And there's no grappling. If you don't know grappling, grappling is pretty boring to watch unless you're really educated in it. So they are two minute rounds, five two minute rounds. The fight is, you're in and out of there in 20 minutes and people are swinging for defenses. Baboon's fight, his first one was a five round fight. His next two fights for the title and defend the title were 40 seconds, 41 seconds. Wow. Jim Ellers, the guy that did the last guy fought, he said he's never been hit that hard in his life. Great guy. All these guys are so humble, so nice. You know, everyone does the show for sell tickets and blah, blah, blah. Right. They get under each other's skin. I'm um, in the end, though, they have so much respect for each other. But these guys are intense. This is a serious sport, a serious thing, and I think it's going to be, I really think it's going to be the biggest thing in the world. Yeah, I think it's growing like crazy. Another guy to watch out for, and obviously, like I said, you know, everyone I've met in the gym just from being here a few days is, uh, you know, treated us extremely well, so nice. It comes down from you from the top. Started with Angela Dundee and Muhammad Ali. This place is just such a legacy here, and it's an honor for me to speak to you guys. And for everyone watching, please go check out our page at The Pod Matrix. Also, the Fifth Street Gym podcast coming out soon. Can't wait for that. You guys are going to crush it with that. So many amazing stories to be told out of this gym. So I'm Patrick Healy with Brooklyn Boxing Podcast. Tom and Tom and Dino. Dino and Tom, sorry, here at Fifth Street. Thanks so much. Awesome. Appreciate it, guys. I am the greatest.